We're starting a new section here, uh, centrifuges. Centrifuges are just a continuation of the previous sections we've been looking at. Uh, so we've looked at mechanical separations of solids and, uh, in, in liquids. So we just made sure we gravitational settling. And we looked a little bit at particle size distributions because that's the concept of particle size distribution is going to be used here in this section. And now we're going on to centrifuges. Anyone seen a centrifuge? Lab scale, industrial scale, large scale, lab scale. So most of us are comfortable with the lab scale centrifuges. We're going to look at that just as a brief intro and then look at some of the um, centrifuges we'll see in practical applications of large scale. So for your reference, here's a, there's a number of um, books and articles that I've used to compile this notes. The first one, Jim Coppolis, you may have. And then uh, this other one is also recommended on the course, this is the CEDA textbook. And then uh, Harry's is also very good for this section. <coughs> so centrifuges are just a way for us to really accelerate the process that we would have had otherwise from natural gravity separation. So gravity, which is freely available to us, that's our energy separating agent, gravity. We don't pay for that one. But sometimes that one just isn't good enough. So we need to go beyond the effects of gravity. And especially for cases where we're dealing with very small particle size diameters. We cannot rely on gravity for small particles because what we'll find is small particles will actually never settle down. The Brownian motion that's, that's very consistent uh, keeps those particles suspended. Very, very small convection currents to be transferred through that uh, equipment will set up uh, those convection currents and those particles again won't settle out for those reasons. And then um, you might be familiar with the concept of an emulsion. So something like, uh, what's an emulsion that you're familiar with? Paint. Milk, paint, mayonnaise. So all of those are emulsions, um, that's the type of idea. And in industrial practice, we often like, obtain emulsions coming out of our process that we need to separate. So the question here is, for these systems that um, rely on small particle sizes to be separated from the fluid, why don't we just flocculate the system and, and then use sedimentation which is free after that? So recall flocculation simply brings smaller particles together into an agglomerate. We get a larger diameter particle that separates out much faster. So if we're dealing with very, very small particles, why don't we just flocculate them and then use free sedimentation? Right, so very often our flocculate will just disturb the system that you're dealing with. If we're dealing with wastewater treatment, Flocculation is often quite okay, but many times for bioprocesses, the products we're dealing with from the separator, either the solid particles or the liquid particles, would be inappropriate to have a flocculant in that environment, either due to damage or could be toxic to uh, subsequent human consumption of that product. So, for example, orange juice. If you're trying to filter out pulp from orange juice, you don't want to use a flocculant because you want to sell that juice afterwards as orange juice, not juice plus. Okay, so. Flocculation is appropriate in certain circumstances, but in many other instances it's not. So we need to get by um, by that. So one, one way to do that is to simply take our gravitational sedimentation and in increase that gravitational field. So that energy that we were getting for free from gravity, well, let's replace that with, with another force field. And we can do that using um, centrifuges. So the principle of the lab centrifuge, as you've seen, uh, many of you have slightly encountered these, is we, we place our samples into the centrifuge, balance it, and then start the rotation. As the system rotates, that suspension, that initially mixed material that we've added, starts to separate into two pieces. We get the precipitate forming at the extreme end, so the solid particles, that hard packed concentration of particles, the precipitate forms at the one end, sometimes also called the pellet, and then above that is the remaining liquid that's been now clarified, the supernatant. 
So those are the terms that we use for lab centrifuges. We also use those terms for continuous large-scale centrifuge. So one of the steps we we're going to end up with tomorrow's class is in tomorrow's class we're going to design a centrifuge for separating beer. So yeast culture from beer. But that's done on a continuous basis on a large scale. We obviously cannot do that in this sort of environment, but the same terminology and principle applies. So here's a batch separator. Tomorrow we're going to see continuous separators. Now, we've used for many, many years to, to separate particles from the fluid, and the key principle that is based on the density difference. We'll emphasize that again coming up. Um, it's also really interesting that you can use centrifusion to separate two liquids of different density. So it's not, not solely particles being separated from fluid here that we're referring to. Two immiscible liquids can be separated. Even two gases of very different densities can be separated, which is really neat. Okay. Um, we will apply centrifusion in the cases where we need to simply just further drain the fluid from our particles. Okay, so if I've got a cake of fluid that's got a certain percentage moisture, I can go take that moisture, uh, like that cake plus moisture, put it in an oven and dry it out. That energy that I'm adding to dry it out is fairly costly. It may be more economical to first centrifuge some of the liquid out, so I don't have to pay to heat up the water, take it to its heat of vaporization. That heat of vaporization delta H is often quite substantial and costly. So it might be cheaper for me to first centrifuge the solids and liquids, drain those solids to a lower depth, uh, moisture content, and then do a drying step right at the end. So centrifuging is often done as a pre-step prior to drying. And we're going to see drying in the last few weeks of this course. Okay, so this is a, a, a prior unit operation often to drying. Um, another really cool way of looking at this is uh, just look up what centrifugal pack beds look like. Central so here's some examples that you may be familiar with. Uh, separating fluid from milk. Milk is an emulsion, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, clarification. So this is a that again, clarifiers to separate um, yeast or other suspended small particles from juice, beer, essential oils often as well. Um, those of you in the bio stream have encountered uh, this bio-separation of blood, viruses, proteins, and other cell cultures. And then, for those of you that end up uh, looking and working in the oil sands, uh, you'll come across separating sand and water um, from many oils. And so it's a, it's a widely used, used unit op. So here's an interesting one. Um, let's take a look at this. This is a pretty interesting centrifuge here to enrich uranium. Um, it's a very tall, thin, Centrifuge named after this guy, so it's, it's called a zippy type of centrifuge or zip. I'm not sure how exactly to pronounce that. The key point here that why I've included this is because we're separating gas from gas, and there's only a 1.26 percent difference in the density between the two gases. Okay, so what they do is they've got this whole cascade of countercurrent separators. We're going to take a look at that, uh, just talk a little bit more about it later on, but uh, these systems here are super well controlled. They're such fine, finely controlled systems uh, to make that separation work. And uh, because of that very small delta in the density, we require so many of these in, in a cascaded fashion. So that's, a, that's an interesting... Um, if an unusual separator that you're unlikely to encounter, but it's, it's worth, uh, worth knowing about. Let's uh, discuss the principle behind centrifugal separations. The, the, as I've mentioned twice now, the density difference is the key. Okay, it's not the fact that we've got a solid in a liquid or the particle size that's causing the difference, uh, the, the, the separation. It's the fact that we've got two materials of different densities in there that's causing the separation. Okay, so it's not based on mass only. Uh, one, one way to see that is if you consider emulsions. So like um, we, we mentioned mayonnaise. So YouTube is full of these interesting videos of people doing things with centrifuges. Um, so there's mayonnaise going into the centrifuge. 
an hour later, you break it down to its two constituents, which is water lake and water. So, um, <laughs> yeah, like I said, there's tons of other interesting videos out there on, on what people do with that. Um, so, the, the key principle here is that the force that we're separating with is a centrifugal force. So, <coughs> let's, uh, let's discuss that. If you take, uh, if you're standing over here at, at, at a point and you're holding a piece of string with a weight to attached to the end of this, you've all done this like as a kid, and you start swinging it around. Um, you're swinging that weight around, there's a force acting in the outward direction. That's the centrifugal force. There's the equal and opposite force acting in this direction, which is called the centripetal force. So that's the pull that you feel on that string, is the centripetal force. The force of the particle or the weight flying outwards is the centrifugal force. And so when you're rotating it around like that, those two forces are in balance, which is why the particle goes around in a circle stays on at that radius. So it's the same principle here. We're going to take a particle and we're going to apply the centrifugal force to it. And that centrifugal force is given by MA, the acceleration, and acceleration is R omega squared. So this is what we've learned in our physics courses. We, we derive that it's equal to R omega squared, where R is the radial distance from the center point and omega is the angular velocity that that particle is experiencing. So it's measured in radians per second, <coughs> is that angular velocity that's <coughs> going around that. And if you just want to put some numbers onto that, one, so one, a full circle, a full rotation, a full revolution is two pi radians. So if you're rotating at one radians per second, so let's get used to SI units. Uh, which we're going to use in all our problems here. Radians per second, if you're rotating at radians per second, that's, you're going to do a full circle in 10 seconds. It's going to take 10 seconds to do one full circular rotation or revolution. Um, so one radian per second is equivalent to 10 revolutions per minute. Sorry, I should say six seconds to do, to do that. So 10 seconds to do uh, uh, 10 revolutions per minute. I totally messed that up, so let's do that again. <laughs> okay, so we're going around a circle, we know that it's two pi radians. It's about, that's approximately another plus to six point something. So to do a full circle um, in a minute, how many, let's ask rather, how many circle, circular rotations can you do in a minute? About 10, so 10 revolutions per minute. So we'll often see this two notations, revolutions per minute, RPM. So that's that number 9.55, is where the more exact number comes from. But we prefer to work in, and we need to work in, in fact, SI units. So radians per second is what we will do. Revolutions per minute is often what we'll see quoted. But to do the calculations, we need to switch over to, um, to radians per second. The next interesting thing is to let's consider the number of g-forces acting on that particle. So as this particle is being, being rotated around, what is the force acting on it in, um, in G's, expressed in G? So G is simply the ratio between the actual force being experienced by the particle, R omega squared. That's the same as um, that acceleration that up here. So that acceleration, R omega squared, and we just ratio it over G, the number of gravitational, um, well, the one gravitational force. And so let's get an order of magnitude idea of, of G's here. So if you're going around a curve in your car, so you're turning left at the traffic light at the intersection, you're turning on the side of the road, you drive on the right hand, right? So go this way, and you're in the back seat of the car. There's someone on the left back seat and someone on the right back seat. Which one experiences the greater gravitational force? Oh, it's the greater centrifugal force. The left. Right. Yeah, this in the back right experiences the greater. Okay, so they're at a on from the turning radius perspective. So if we, this radius of turning is over here, that person on the back right is going to experience the greater force. They're further away from the center point. Okay, that number of g's that depending on how fast you go around that corner is between one to two g's. So if you back up in the revolution per minute, it's about ten. 
And that's, a tip, that's a, actually a quite a fast rotation. It's 15. Even 10 is pretty quick around the corner. Um, your washing machine at home is doing in the order of 625 Gs for a washing machine which has got about a quarter meter radius. It's a half a meter diameter washing machine. It's about, that's a standard figure there. So 625 Gs is pretty substantial for the washing machine cycle. When we're looking at industrial centrifuges, we're going quite a bit further than that. 25,000 is pretty typical for an industrial centrifuge. Okay, so that's a, a lot of energy going, going into the system over there. The lab scale centrifuge, we can get much, much higher because we're at a smaller scale. So there, those, those numbers are around 100,000 to, to half a million. Now that Zippy type centrifuge I showed earlier, that's got Gs in the order of a million Gs to separate those two gases. So each one of those tall towers is got a million. <coughs> Geez, and if you calculate the tangential velocity, the tip speed of that, it's uh, greater than Mach 2, so over 700 meters per second. It's so fast that the only way that those systems can be operated is they have to draw a vacuum in there so they can actually reach those speeds. And the other thing is even fingerprints on those devices will offset the stability of the, of the centrifuge. Okay? So, those are very, very sensitive devices, and in fact, as we'd imagine, they're only used pretty much in government and military operations. <coughs> and interesting stories there about how various governments try to upset other governments' abilities of separating. Okay, which you can go read about. So, let's take a look then at uh, how you can specify a laboratory centrifuge for operation. The real thing that we're interested in is how long. So you put your sample in, how long do you need to have it settle? Um, or before it separates, I should say. So you want to calculate that duration T for a given speed that you specify. So you dial in the number of revolutions per minute that your machine is capable of, um, or at a certain point that you wish to operate at. So it's RPM max. The reason why it's max is because obviously there's a warm-up period. As the machine gets to that RPM, that it's that then operating for a while. So how long do you leave it operating at that maximum RPM? Well, a fairly simple equation that you, you use, you look at these constants, the Svedrich coefficients on tables, um, and that table is very dependent on the type of media you separate. It's, it's all correlation based. There's no theoretical calculation we do here. Look up those values. Uh, there's, for example, that value for collagen. You then substitute in to this formula for K. K is a function of the minimum and maximum radius on that uh, centrifuge. So R min is the inner radius, R max is the outer radius of your sample. And uh, you plug in R max, calculate K, and then substitute in all of that to calculate the time that you need in minutes. None of, it, none of the units cancel out. There's no dimensional analysis that you can do here. It's all purely correlation based. So, so that's labs, and it's uh, it's pretty pretty straightforward. The only requirement is obviously knowing what this is, and there's uh, tables that one can consult for. Them. So we don't focus on that too much in this course. Because we're looking at continuous um, and and industrial applications. So let's take a look at those next. Okay, so let's uh, let's unpack this. There's a there's a lot of information on the slide. Um, and especially for us that we've never seen these devices in, in practice, let's try to understand what is going on here in terms of the particles trajectory. So we will use this for fluid solid separations when our solid is suspended. I will bring my mixture of material in and have it feed at this point. Okay, so here I've shown it coming in from the top and coming in, and that's where my solid fluids leave, and I feed or enter, I should say, enter into the centrifuge. I could also enter in from the bottom. The reason why I've drawn it like this is you're going to see in the video that I have in a minute why um, that's how the feed is entered. But it can equally well just, just have an opening over here and you feed it. So this device is rotating around this vertical axis. So we've got spin going in this direction. And what occurs is that that fluid and solid mixture immediately gets thrown out to the side, the centrifugal force. 
and we actually get a vertical wall of liquid forming. So there's the outer container of my, my vessel. I, I form a vertical wall of liquid. So if we looked at this from the top view, what you would see there is you've got your outer bowl and then your inner radius. So here's that center point that everything's rotating around. There's R1, that inner radius, and here's R2, the outer radius. Okay? And this is basically we're saying there's a vertical wall of water that's in that uh, circular shape. So it's, it's much, much easier to see it via video. And so what I did is Last year, I really struggled to explain this concept. I found a neat video on YouTube, except it's like eight minutes long. So I've cut out pieces that I just wanted to, to use to show. Um, and this guy explains it a bit in non-technical language. And he's doing this in his garage with the top of the centrifuge off, sticking his hands into it in a very unsafe manner. So what I'm about to show you here is not something I recommend you try. Um, nevertheless, it's, it's very instructive. One, Unfortunate thing in Cambridge is that we cannot just bring distillation columns to our class to show you this is how they look. The okay. Mechange, Me Mechange, Civil, they have an easier time. Yeah, not us. So uh, we have to resort to YouTube. And uh, bring it up to 6,000 RPMs. And then I'm going to slowly start introducing this colored liquid. And you can see on the side what's going to happen. So our feed is in the center. So that feed is 
being fed continually on a, in, a, in an actual unit who are continuously feeding liquid into the center. And so the fluid is overflowing this lip and then just being flung out of the bowl over that lip. So you see this uh, black seal over here? Okay, so there would be a cap that goes on top of that, over that, covering all of this so you, you cannot see what's operating inside. Um, and so that cap over it is catching all the fluid that's being flung out, and that fluid is what's leaving at that exit point over there. The four holes that are in the center, those are only used when you're draining the system at the end. Okay, so they're not used in, in normal operation. Everyone clear on the principle of that system? Is this a batch? This is still a batch system, right? So um, we continually feed liquid. The solids build up on the interior. So the solids will build up inside this gap. And then you stop the system, clean it out. It takes a couple of minutes, and you restart it back up. So solids will build up on the wall. Yeah. So it's mostly just a solid liquid separator? It's a solid liquid separator. There are other ways, uh, same principle, slightly different internals that you can make the system separate two liquids. Okay, so what will happen if you've, set, if you've got two liquids of different density? The higher density water will be retained against the wall. Right, so yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the lighter liquid will be near, near the inner radius and the heavier liquid will be more dense liquid will be at the, at the wall. <coughs> so then you need to set the way on this lip over here to extract both the heavier density liquid and the lighter density. So I have a diagram of that coming up in the notes. The laboratory. Yeah. Can you go to the slide with the laboratory? They they actually have like arms. It's not like a bolt, or is that just like the side shot? So it's just a it's a it swings on like pivot point, right? So as the centrifugal force gets higher and higher, it goes up. And it just stays like that. Those, so those arms that you see in the light gray, those are actually the sample containers that you put in the centrifuge. Uh, so those were, those are the ones that you kind of slot into those openings you see over here. You see this whole sequence of openings. You slot your sample container into those. Yeah, and you obviously need to make sure that they're balanced. So let's uh, understand then how particles move. Because in the video you just saw the liquid flow. Let's understand now how a particle moves in that system. We've got our particle coming in here at the feed point, and immediately with the liquid it's flung to that, to that interface, interfacial point, so R1. That's where the particles begin its path. Okay? And there's a centrifugal force operating on that particle proportional to r omega squared, where r is this radius, r1. The centrifugal force is r omega squared at that point. Now, I'm feeding fluid continually in the So this fluid that's up here at the bottom is going to get displaced a few seconds later by the new fluid that's coming in. So this fluid slowly travels, there's an upward velocity <coughs> in, in that upward direction due to the new fluid coming in and forcing the old fluid out. So there's a continual change of fluid through the system. There's also a velocity for that particle and the fluid, uh, sorry, just for the particle, I would say, in the horizontal direction. And so there's that centrifugal force acting on that particle proportional to r omega squared. So as this particle is being forced up, it's also getting flung out to the edges. And that force is changing with radial positions. Let's take a look at how that, that happens. Let's uh, go back to our Stokes law that we derived last week. So last week we derived that first equation up there. And it holds in situations where Reynolds number is less than 1. We calculate the gravitational terminal setting velocity. And it's a function of the particle diameter, the density difference, the viscosity, and then importantly, G over there. Now, in centrifuge, what we've done is we've gone to replace G with R omega squared. Okay, so we ignore gravitational effect. The gravitational pull on this particle downwards is nothing. Right? Relative to all the other forces taking place in the system, gravity is, can be totally ignored. 
Interestingly, you can operate the centrifuge on its side, you can operate it upside down, it will still work exactly the same way. So gravity can be totally ignored. Okay, so we've got gravity that we simply replace with r omega squared. And our equation then says that the velocity in the horizontal component due to centrifugal force is the change in radius with time, dr by dt, so the rate of radial change with time, the velocity, in other words, in the centrifugal direction, horizontal direction, is given by that provided Stokes law holds. So provided Reynolds number is less than one, that equation is true. Then as I've mentioned before, that particle also has a component of velocity in the vertical direction due to fluid flow. Just the simple fluid flow, and we can easily calculate that. We know the volume of that, that region, we know the volumetric feed flow rate, so uh, the, the ratio of those two gets me the velocity. Now, is it true that Reynolds number is going to be less than one in the centrifuge? Is that a safe assumption to make? Pretty much always is. Um, you can always obviously check it. That's uh, that's a no-brainer, and you will in, in problems. But uh, the reality is, you wouldn't be using a centrifuge if Reynolds number was greater than one. The same, you, your particles will settle out so quickly by themselves in those situations. Right? You wouldn't even have considered a centrifuge to begin with. Um, so every case where a centrifuge is actually useful is a case where Reynolds number is going to be smaller than one, and very very much smaller than one. We'll, we'll derive uh, some calculations and you'll see that those, those numbers for Reynolds are very, very small. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's do some integration. We want to calculate the time it's going to take for a particle at this point over here. So this diagram is a little bit inaccurate. So this particle is at R1 at the feed point in time. So at T0, I'm feeding that particle in. I would like to know how how long it's going to take for that particle to reach radius R2. So I want to reach the wall in a certain time. Sorry, let's say I want to reach the wall, which is at a radius R2. How long is it going to take for the particle to go from R1 to R2, given the properties of the particle? So it's a very easy, actually, integration. We take that formula here, it's dr by dt is equal to some function, um, I'm just going to call it function s because it's a function of Stokes. So we can just calculate dr by this function s is dt, integrate both sides between 0 and t star, and find the integral from r1 to r2. Okay, so take that Stokes' function that's over there. Notice that it is a function of r itself, so when we do that integration, that's where the logs come from on the next slide, because we've got an r in the denominator, so we, we expect logs showing up in our integral. So you can prove that to yourself at home, uh, that you get that formula for t star. t star then is simply the side of the integral, so t star minus zero. If you integrate between r1 and r2, the inverse of that Stokes uh, expression on the previous slide, you can prove that you get that time. So that's the time it takes for this particle to go from this point on whatever journey it's going to take and land up at the wall R2. Okay, so particles with smaller diameters will take a different trajectory to particles with a larger diameter. What will be the trajectory of a particle with a larger diameter? Relative to this one shown, a particle of a diameter larger to this one, will this particle end up to the left or the right of this trajectory? So a, a particle with larger diameter d is going to land up at the wall much, much earlier. A particle with smaller diameter d is going to land up somewhere over there and actually not even make it to the wall. Okay, it, it won't actually get to R2. It will only get to that point at the top. Okay, so now we've got a time taken for a particle of a given size, dp, travel from R1 to R2. Let's uh, take a look at it for, uh, from another perspective. Yes, Mark? So the reason that the uh, uranium centrifuges are so high is because it takes a lot longer for that separation to happen. 
Uh, so those uranium centrifuges are gas-gas separation. So there's, there's no solids involved in there. The reason why they're, they're tall is because of, it's actually easier to get uh, greater stability. Okay, and also they, you just need that, that residence time. So there's a bit to separate because it's such a small difference between the guys. Yeah, so the, there's a long time duration required, and so you get multiple multiple of these centrifuges and um, they're in that cascade at counter current. So if we let's take a look here, if we take a particle that's moving too slowly in a horizontal direction. Okay, so what we're saying then this particle is is <coughs> over here and it's moving relatively Relative to this one, it's taking a longer time because maybe let's say the centrifuge is turned down too low. So omega is smaller, the rotational speed is smaller, that particle is not experiencing as great a force as, as, as our reference case. It, that particle is not going to make it to the wall. In fact, that particle will only make it to somewhere along that horizontal surface up there. When our, terminology that we say, or our convention that we say then is that that particle, if it doesn't make it to the wall, we're going to assume that it, it gets taken out in the supernatant. So we can we can say this particle travels up. If it didn't make it to R2, we assume that it just flips and goes out with the liquid. So what we want then is to make sure all our particles do make it to this wall R2 within that given time period. That's a little bit confusing because we know that in reality that that retaining wall that you saw there in the video, that horizontal piece of metal that defines the distance between R1 and R2 should actually in fact track the particle. A particle that lands up over there isn't just going to go out. It will probably travel along that horizontal axis for, um, for some period of time. But the reason why we use that convention is because remember, this is not the first particle to go up here. Eventually, there's going to be a wall, a diagonal amount of particles built up in that corner. So there's going to be a this sort of buildup over here of particles. So eventually, particles that don't make it to R2, they will get um, will get taken out of the supernatant. Okay, so this T star really gives us a, a bound, a worst case bound for operation. So what we say is, well, let's recognize that that's the case. Uh, we're going to work with the difference. Uh, value later on. But uh, let's just go with that for now. Let's just go with the worst case situation first. Then we're going to make things uh, a little bit more realistic in a minute. So where we're at now, now we know how long a particle should be in the centrifuge, that time, T star. We can calculate the feed flow rate in order so the particles can stay in the centrifuge for that time. So. If we look uh, back at, at that centrifuge diagram, I'll just redraw it over here. There's my vertical wall of water, and, and there's R1, and here's R2. I'm going to feed material in over here at some flow rate Q. So Q in meters cubed per second is my feed flow rate. I'd like to, what I'm asking then is, what should that volumetric feed flow rate be? so that those particles remain in the centrifuge for that given time. Right? If I increase Q, those particles get forced out by the high volumetric flow rate. If I decrease Q, the particles will stay in for a much longer period of time. I, basically what I'm asking is how long or how much feed can I put into the centrifuge at what flow rate so that I get particles remaining in there for a period of time. Start. So to do that, I need to know what is the volume of fluid occupied in the centrifuge. And that's simply the difference between the two radiuses squared multiplied by pi times the height of the centrifuge. So, so the height of the centrifuge, the difference then between R2 squared, R1 squared multiplied by pi gives me the volume of fluid in the centrifuge. Divide that by T star, that will calculate for me then the volumetric flow rate I can use. Okay, so if we operate on our centrifuge at a faster flow rate, those particles will remain there for a shorter period of time um, and may not actually reach the wall. The other way that this is used quite, quite typically is as follows. We know we, we've got a certain feed to treat. We've got a certain 
volume of fluid we need to get, get through that centrifuge. What is the largest particle diameter? So we know Q, we know T star, we can calculate then basically what is dp? What is that particle diameter, the largest particle diameter that will arrive at the wall R2? Okay. That gives me a, an idea of the particle sizes that I'm able to separate and the particles that will then leave through the supernatant. So that's my, uh, uh, what we will see in a minute, we'll call as my cut point. Particles with smaller diameter will leave, we won't be able to track those particles with larger diameter. The aim is to get all the particles to actually reach the wall. The aim is, is usually to get all the particles out of your system, but oftentimes we have simple specifications on our product. So we simply say we guarantee particles of this size are, are caught, and then smaller particles are not. They're assumed to be the remain suspended. Remember, it, this all comes down to separation factors. Higher separation factors, so you Less solids, it's going to cost more money. So it's a reason not a constraint. The key thing that, that sometimes trips people up is that R2 is not a number that you can go change. R2 is simple physics of the system or configuration of the system. Once you buy a centrifuge with a given R2, that's it. So R2 is fixed, R1 is, is also fixed um, in, in some centrifuges. Some centrifuges allow you to adjust R1. So this inner radius can sometimes be adjusted, but R2 is the outer radius of the ball, and that's that's a fixed number. You don't get to change that once you become <coughs> sponge. Okay, so now let's take a look at a small modification. When we said that the particles will land up at R2 within that time, that's, that's obviously a fair, fairly drastic assumption. So my vertical wall of water is here. This is R1. This radius over here is R2. What we're saying is that we're, we're prepared for a particle to travel and land up at height H, not necessarily at R2, but we're often willing for that particle to land up even over there, and then it's just going to move horizontally. So what we we what we do is we redo our integration, except this time we integrate not from R1 to R2, but from R1 to the midpoint of R1 and R2, so at 50% between them. Okay, that's a more realistic assumption. And once we change our convention to that, that is what in, in the industry is called the cut point. So the time taken for a particle to go from R1 to the midpoint of R1 and R2. Redo your integration, the only term that changes is that log in the denominator. And that gets you flow rates that are, are higher. You can then put more material through the through your centrifuge if you design on that on that basis. Is that clear? Okay, so just a different convention. There's obviously the more extreme, more conservative convention, and then there's this more realistic convention which we use, and then that's called the cut points. Now we could also use any other point between R1 and R2, but by by uh, conventions that he made. And that 50% will also account for uncertainties in our flow patterns, physical properties. We obviously cannot measure our physical properties with, with 100% accuracy. And we've made some ideal assumptions, so uh, that builds in a bit of uncertainty there for us. Okay, so here's, here's an example. Uh, let's uh, not just rush in and do the calculations, but let's do that planning strategy that we've spoken about in the earlier class. So read through this problem. The main, we really will probably only solve part one and maybe part two in today's class and we'll continue the rest on tomorrow. So what I'd like to do is just define what you know and what you don't know and particularly draw a diagram. That's the first step. Define what you know and don't know. Draw a diagram and plan your strategy for question one and question two.
So I'll let you do part two, three, and four at home. Let's just work through part one then. Uh, drawing the diagram is exactly what the previous diagram we had on the slide, so I won't go and redo that. And in this instance, we're given a lot of information. Pretty much everything we need in this uh, question is given to us. There's very little that we need to guess or assume. Uh, so let's uh, go, we've done the, that's the defined step, essentially. In the explore step, what is the principle of operation? Well, we've got centrifugal force occurring here. Uh, centrifugal force is proportional to r omega squared. Um, it looks like this question is just a straightforward application of the theory. Because we're given so much information, um, we can simply go ahead and use one of those previously derived formulas. The planning strategy, though, here is, well, to calculate g, g we know is uh, r omega squared divided by g. Uh, we're given that we need to calculate this at r2, so that's the r we're going to use. Omega is the other value we need. Do we have information for omega? Yeah, we do. It's just not in the correct unit, so there's going to be a unit change required over there, g, which we know. So that's my strategy for part one. Um, and you can go ahead and calculate that, and uh, I'll lead you to do that at home to prove to yourself that that 6109 genes are uh, being experienced by that particle. You notice it's totally independent of the particle's diameter. A small particle and a large particle will experience the same genes. Okay? So if you're turning the corner of the traffic light left, the big guy in the back and the small guy in the back, they're all experiencing the same genes. Okay, that's, no, it's not dependent on the size of the particle. Then, uh, what's your strategy for part two? Okay. Uh, we'll go through the calculations tomorrow, but essentially you'd simply use the formulas Q is equal to V divided by T star. So we Q star. Okay. And we've given most of the information for all of the information to calculate. That's a straightforward number crunching. So let's compare those values tomorrow and you can try question three and four.